Perú's interim president, Manuel Merino, has stepped down after coming under fire for Saturday's violent crackdown on protesters. A new museum has opened in Chile, displaying murals and graffitis that were the backbone of the anti-government protests last year. At least 20 people have been arrested in the U.S. after a clash broke out between supporters of President Donald Trump and a group of anti-Trump protesters in Washington, D.C. Hello, welcome to From the South. My name is Gladys Quesada from the Telesur Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. Stay with us. Peru's interim president, Manuel Merino, has stepped down after coming under fire for Saturday's violent crackdown on protesters. Merino's resignation comes after half his new cabinet quit over the death of two people in protests condemning the impeachment of former president Martin Vizcarra. Congress voted last Monday to remove Vizcarra as head of state over bribery allegations, which he denies. It's not yet clear who will be the next president, the fourth leader since 2016, as Peru battles the coronavirus pandemic with the worst economic contraction forecast in a century. I hereby tender my irrevocable resignation from the office of President of the Republic and call for peace and unity among all Peruvians. Prior to Marino's resignation, lawmakers of the Congress had already gathered in an extraordinary session to discuss the political crisis and push for Marino's resignation. There is already an agreement in the Board of Spokespersons of Congress that the censure presented by the Alliance for Progress Party will be proceeded in a few minutes. And so will an extraordinary plenary to proceed to a process of transition and elect a new board of directors in parliament and a new president of the republic. Mr. Marino cannot stay one more minute in the government palace, after what he has done to the Peruvian people. I urge Congress of the Republic that today we fix this constitutional crisis. Marino's resignation comes after at least two people were killed and 60 injured during the violent police crackdown on Saturday's rally in Lima. Thousands of Peruvians had gathered outside the Congress and government palace to protest political instability, corruption and the lack of resources for education and health. Authorities said the two victims were men aged 24 and 25 who died due to the gunshot wounds received during the demonstrations. Millions of Brazilians are voting for new mayors and councillors in more than 5,300 cities and towns across the country. The elections are the first since Jair Bolsonaro became president in 2019. The results will be seen as a barometer for his prospects in 2022 presidential polls. Bolsonaro's far-right coalition heads into today's election battered by a surge in unemployment rates amid rejection to its handling of the coronavirus pandemic. Urban planning, environmental planning, health planning, education are decided at the local level. So these local elections are very important and we also influence the next presidential elections in 2022. In the United States, the election was extremely special within the context of the pandemic. And here too the pandemic is part of the elections. The political response to the pandemic are among the proposals of many candidates. And heavy rains caused floods in Barbados, which led to the death of one man. 21-year-old Johannes Johnson was killed after a car in which he was traveling got washed away by floodwaters in St. Lucie on Saturday. Johnson's body was found two hours later along the water coast. It was a mile away from the vehicle.
People in Honduras are fleeing their homes as Hurricane Ayora forms in the Caribbean. Less than two weeks after the powerful storm Ida killed more than 200 across Central America, authorities on Saturday warned that Ayora was likely to batter coastal areas of Nicaragua and Honduras. Authorities have ordered the evacuation in the area of San Pedro Sula, the country's second city and industrial capital, located 180 kilometers north of Tegucigalpa. The U.S. National Hurricane Center for a Cast tropical storm Ida Iora, sorry, to become a category two or three hurricane as it moves into the region by late Sunday or early Monday. I have witnessed how people have tried to go out and get the few things they have left. People walking, biking, motorcycles, looking for ways to pick up the little we have left since the water took almost everything. All the little things we had are gone, and here we have no help from anyone. And we'll go now to a short break. Follow us on Twitter and stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. A new museum has opened in Chile displaying murals and graffitis that were the backbone of the anti-government protests last year. Dozens of art pieces which were created in the streets of Santiago were recreated or taken to the museum. This was done to protect the artwork and to give more citizens an opportunity to view it. It is located a few blocks from Dignity Square, the main site of the protest. Along with the demonstrations, a cultural movement also emerged in Chile where art was used to represent the anger of living with social inequalities and to showcase their hope for a better future. Jury from the public space to this place allow us to stop all the attempts to erase what is expressed in the streets. And we assure this is perpetrator or at least exposed in a longer term. The call to begin, this began from the same street. You can see how people have accumulated for a long time a discontent that has to do with not only asking for one thing, but also noticing that our artistic expressions have all transformed towards these demands. They have all changed towards a protest. They have all changed towards showing the things that hurt us. Cuando llegamos aquí, vinimos directamente aquí. The number of people who have fled to Sudan from the fighting between Ethiopian government forces and Tigray rebels has risen to at least 20,000. According to the UN, more than 12,500 crossed the Hamdayat border, while nearly 7,500 crossed from the south of Adalugdi in the last seven days. Local agencies are trying to assist the refugees who have been arriving with few provisions. Ethiopia's Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed ordered military operations in Tigray last week in response to attacks on two federal military camps by Tigrayan fighters. On November 11, 205 Ethiopian refugees were transferred to Al Sharab camp, and on November 13, 1,115 were transferred to the Umrakuba camp in Gadaref. Still in Ethiopia, at least 34 people have been killed in an attack on a passenger bus by a known gunman. According to the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission, the attacks happened on Saturday night in the Beni Shangul Gumuz region. No group has claimed responsibility for the attack yet. 45 people were killed by armed militiamen in the same region two months ago. Thousands of supporters of the ruling party of the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Union for Democracy and Social Progress, have taken to the streets of capital Kinshasa. Protesters sought to express their support for President Felix Tisenkedi and his plan to withdraw from the alliance with former President Joseph Kabila and his front for the Congo party. The supporters who attempted to burn an effigy of Kabila accused the former president of undermining President Tshisekedi. On November 2, Tshisekedi announced plans to reconfigure the political alliance that brought him to power in December 2018.
We are marching to support the head of state during the national consultations so that our country can change and move forward for the good of the people. The president must make decisions in favor of the population. This is why for us, this is a moment to tell him that we are behind him. We support him and we warn all those who want to put the interests of the population aside. Land and air borders between Tunisia and Libya reopened on Saturday after a seven-month closure due to the coronavirus restrictions. The closure at the end of March had a severe impact on trade between the two countries and left Libyans and Tunisians stranded on either side of the border. Many Tunisians travel to Libya for work, while Libyans regularly go to Tunisia for medical treatments. Along the reopening, a common Tunisian Libyan protocol was put in place following a meeting in Tunis on the 21st of October 2020. The protocol was sent in order for Tunisians and Libyans to use it when they enter or exit. To cross, the passengers should have a negative PCR test and has to quarantine for 10 days. We will be prioritizing the sick and the ones who have special cases. There is a special protocol that will be followed, and protective measures will be taken, such as wearing masks and social distancing. Along the, the Israeli government is moving forward with the construction of new settlements in the occupied West Bank. The housing ministry has opened up bids for the more than 12,000 homes earmarked for construction in the Jivad Hamatos area. Human rights groups say the new settlement will seal off the Palestinian city of Bethlehem from East Jerusalem, further cutting off Palestinians' access to the city. Israel's policy of settling its citizens in occupied territories and displacing local residents is in contravention of international humanitarian laws. <laughs> And we have more news coming up after a final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. At least 20 people have been arrested in the U.S. after a clash broke out between supporters of President Donald Trump and a group of anti-Trump protesters in Washington, D.C. Security forces were deployed after anti-Trump protesters marched into the White House, clashed with a group of Trump loyalists who were gathered to protest against the election results. Trump supporters have been demonstrating since the announcement of the results of the presidential elections, which they claim has been rigged. And Myanmar opposition supporters have gone into the streets to protest recent election results, in which the ruling party, National League for Democracy, was declared the winner. The opposition claims that the election were rigged. Myanmar went to the polls on November the 8th to vote for parliamentary elections in which the party led by President Aung San Suu Kyi obtained an absolute majority. We are protesting against the Union Election Commission because we think the election was not fair and there was a problem with fraudulent voting. We are angry about the fraud in this election and we want a free and fair election. So we USDP supporters are protesting against the UEC. Fifteen Asia-Pacific countries have signed the world's biggest free trade deal. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, includes 10 Southeast Asian economies, including China, Japan, South Korea, New Zealand and Australia, with the members accounting for around 30% of the global GDP. The agreement to lower tariff and open up the services trade with the bloc does not include the United States and is viewed as a Chinese-led alternative to a now-defunct Washington Trade Initiative. The deal was proposed in 2012 and finally sealed at the end of the Southeast Asian Summit in Vietnam as leaders push to get their pandemic hit economies back on track. The signing of RCEP agreement today is the pride, the huge achievement of the fact that Asian countries 
with their central roles have together with partner countries laid the foundation for a new stage of cooperation comprehensively and durably heading towards the future in accordance with their level of development and bringing benefits to all countries in the region. And the Belarusian police have used stunt grenades in Minsk to disperse an anti-Lukashenko demonstration. Local media reported that armed and masked police dispersed protesters with tear gas and stun grenades and deployed water cannon shortly after the latest march began against President Alexander Lukashenko. Belarusian rights group Vianza said that at least 328 people were detained, including journalists. Some 15 metro stations were also closed and mobile internet access was limited. For three months running, tens of thousands have taken to the streets of Belarus on Sundays to protest against the disputed re-election of Lukashenko, who has been in power for more than two decades. Moldovans have returned to the polls for the second round of the voting in the country's presidential election, facing a choice between the pro-Russian incumbent and his pro-EU challenger. Former Prime Minister Maya Sandu won the first round on November the 1st, with over 36% of the votes, leaving the incumbent president Igor Dodon trailing by over 3.5 points. During her campaign, Sandu, a former World Bank economist, promised to secure more financial support from Brussels if she became president. Moldova, one of the Europe's poorest country, has been rocked by multiple political crises and a one million bank fraud scheme equivalent to nearly 15% of the country's annual output. Today you have the power to punish the ones who lied, who stole, who impoverished you or made you leave the country. Together we are deciding today how the people of Moldova will live in the next four years. I voted for stability in our foreign relations. I don't want Moldova to become a pawn in international geopolitical games. I voted for friendship with the European Union and with the Russian Federation as well as with Romania and Ukraine. For a balanced foreign policy, I voted for the memory of those who built this country. Hundreds of Catholic followers have staged a demonstration in the French city of Bordeaux against a ban on holding mass. Religious groups have been restricted to gather in small groups in France as one of the measures imposed to curb the spread of the coronavirus. The protesting clerics are calling for the ban to be lifted so they can resume their Sunday mass service. They also demanded restrictions to be lifted for Saturday to allow them to go shopping. Today, we cannot attend mass freely, to worship freely. We are told to stay at home, but what the government does not understand is that it is not enough for a Christian to stay at home and pray at home. We need this communion, this direct participation in sacrifice. Afghan asylum seekers at a makeshift migrant camp on the outskirts of Paris are calling for urgent help as living conditions continue to deteriorate. The health and lives of thousands of refugees who fled war in Afghanistan are at risk due to poor sanitary conditions and lack of adequate shelter. Migrant associations have denounced the poor living conditions in the camp and called for permanent accommodation solution for asylum seekers. Children has right to a safe place to stay and roof top of their head, but they they don't have it. And I'm gonna ask people out there if uh, they would let their children stay out in the danger like this place like this, and uh, they feel hungry and insecure. They would they let their children stay in the danger? Obviously not. We really hope that this time, as there is the confinement people will not be put back on the street before the end of the confinement, which would allow even those who do not fit into the right administrative boxes and who are therefore destined to be put back on the street at some point to have at least a few weeks of respite before having to rebuild a new camp. In Turkey, a historic wooden mosque in Istanbul has caught on fire. 
Turkish firefighter managed to put out the blaze that broke out in the Vanikov Mosque, which was built in the 17th century and is located on the Asian side of Istanbul along the Bosporus Strait. The firefighters prevented the fire from reaching a forest behind the mosque and also the neighboring houses. The cause of the fire was not yet determined and the city's governor said that an investigation had been launched. In sports, in Formula One, Lewis Hamilton equaled Michael Schumacher's record of seven world titles at the Turkish Grand Prix. On Sunday, the British driver also surpassed the German's all-time record of 91 Grand Prix wins to become the sport's most successful racer and 94 wins. He said he was driven by the desire to win, but also pushed the sport and the world to become more diverse and inclusive. He promised to fight for equality so that opportunities for athletes don't depend on the background or color of skin. On his radio communications, after crossing the finishing line, he said, for all the kids out there who dream the impossible, you can do it too. I believe in you guys. Hamilton is, is the sport's first and only black world champion in his 70 years history. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. Also, if you feel so inclined, join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.